Happy Wednesday and welcome to another episode of Brain Scratch Searchlight. I'm John Lorden. Thank you so much for caring about these cases like I do. And all of us caring about these cases together helped make today's episode happen. What am I talking about? A few weeks ago, we profiled Kay Alana Turner. And very soon, I think it was a day after we posted that video, her father left comments thanking us for the coverage and started sharing more information and details that they had about the case. Over the past week or so, her mother's been in contact and told me that some of the news stories that have been posted, even some of the information that we might have used, might not be entirely accurate or might not be the best information. So I told her, let's make that right. Let's go ahead and bring both of them on here today so we can go through some of these details. Just to give you the basics, Kay Alana went missing on March 10th, 2023. It's believed that she might be suffering a mental health crisis, but there might be other medical things at issue also that we'll be discussing with her family as we get into all this. So, um, before I start with them, I just want to say thank you guys so much. It's because of this platform. It's because of the care and the respect that was in that comment section that things like this even happen in terms of her parents reaching out and wanting to be on this platform. So I appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. Let's go ahead and meet Kay Alana's parents. Welcoming to the channel, we have Robbie and Rosa Calhoun. These are the parents of Kay Alana. And just to answer kind of a simple question, um, why is Kay Alana's last name Turner and your last name Calhoun? How'd, how'd that happen? Kay Alana, uh, when she was still in high school, she had a young man that uh, they were in love and they wanted to get married. They actually wanted to get married while they were fresh out of high school. And we asked them to please take at least a year and go to college. And they did. But even at that, uh, after they, did, they got married, it lasted only three years. And Kay Alana just decided that she did get married too young and decided that she would rather not be married. And so they got a divorce. Still a little hard word for me to say, but yeah, uh, they did. And so that would have been in 2017 when that happened. So she kept, she kept the name Turner because in her college work that she had done, everything was in the Turner name. And she had some things that were published, actually. And so uh, she's a very good writer. She's very good at uh, doing research and things like that. She had some research papers that got published. And so that was under Turner. And so for her. Yeah. resume, that kind of thing going forward, she thought Turner would be best. Well, Robbie, please know that I put my parents through the same thing. I got married way too young and uh, I refer to it as my starter marriage now because yeah, it's pretty much same situation. Um, okay. So can you tell us a little bit more about Kay Alana? Like I loved learning about her focus in college. It, it was so unique and it's, it feels like she kind of has this worldview, this kind of worldly touch. But can you tell us a, a little bit more about her? What was she like growing up? She was very inquisitive. She's always been very bright. Um, she was, uh, one example is, um, I remember when she was young, we were swimming in a swimming pool and I was going to go through the motions of teaching her how to swim. And she just pushed me away and said, don't, don't show me, just tell me. And so I, as best I could, described, okay, here's what you do to swim. And she took off swimming. Wow. You know, and she's just really, really bright. She's, her mom says she's got a photographic memory. Um, whenever she attacks anything that she takes an interest in, it's with passion. She uh, doesn't do anything, you know, halfway. And that could be music. She's, <laughs> she's a, a good musician and she's self taught for the most part. Musically, she plays key keyboards and guitar and some other things. Um, academically, she was always very, very bright. Uh, Super smart. She, um, when she was three years old, she decided she wanted to do the national spelling bee. And I was, she, we're watching it on TV and she said, I do that. And I was like, okay, you want to do that? And she's like, yeah. So we spent the next 11 years, her, wanting to learn every word she could. And I would be washing dishes and she would say, mama, can you call spelling words? And I'd be like, no, I'm washing dishes. You know, I would try to take a bath. She'd be like, mama, can you stop? Call spell no, I'm taking a bath, you know? And um, so I would call so many spelling words and she was so smart that um, 
one day we're calling spelling words and I probably called, you know, 900 words that day. And so uh, I said, paradigm. She looked at me and she said, mama, is it paradigm? I said, I don't know. <laughs> Spell it. and We'll see. And of course it was paradigm, but I had, I'd always heard of paradigm. I'd never seen it spelled before. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, she just, she was so smart. Um, she spent much of her life reading because of her heart condition. She had really uh, bad asthma and she was in and out of the hospital when she was little. So she had to um, do something to fill her time. And so she was just a voracious reader and she would always win the reading contest at the library in the summertime. And she actually had read every single book that was appropriate for her in the section of the library. And it got to the point that I was having to read books and I hate reading. <laughs> I was having to read books to make sure that they were appropriate for her to read yeah. before I would let her read them. So, I mean, she just, you know, that's just who she was. She's super smart. What a good mom. What a good mom. It sounds like she <laughs> came from a great family. Um, a big part of this story is talking about mental health struggles and Uh, One of the things I was really moved by is in the first video we put out, a lot of people were sharing about their challenges and some of the larger issues that we have. We we still have not figured out uh, great tools to enable law enforcement to handle situations similar to what we're talking about here. But to, to roll it back just a little bit, when did you first learn about her mental health struggles? Is that something that you saw as she was growing up or is that something that developed more recently? It was, it was all recent. She went to New York city, um, in October of 2019 and was working at a hotel in Times Square. And she was super excited. She would call us like one o'clock in the morning and she would be eating ice cream in Times Square and she would just be having a great time. Well, then in March, COVID hit. And when COVID hit New York City, COVID shut everything down. There was nothing open, but her hotel kept her own. In fact, she was one of the only people that wasn't management that they kept on at the hotel. So then she was riding the subway every day. It was like an hour and a half commute into town, to Times Square and an hour and a half commute back. She lived in Brooklyn. And so she was riding the subway and she sent us pictures in the platform. It looked like the apocalypse. There was nobody just completely empty. And she had sent us pictures before COVID had happened of the subway just bustling, you know, and Times Square bustling. And so there was actually a picture of her standing in Times Square with nothing. I don't even know how she got that picture, but Times Square is completely empty. And um, so she had called me and she said, it's so scary on the, on the train because it still stopped at every single stop. She was the only person on the subway that it was her and the train conductor. And she said when she would get on, she would kind of lock eyes with him so that he knew that she was on there. And um, she said every single stop, the doors would open, the doors would open and nobody would get on. But she every time it stopped, she would like panic because if somebody got on there to hurt her. Yeah, there's no there was nobody to defend her. There was nothing to help her. And um, so I sent her wasp spray and hoping that, you know, if somebody came at her, that she would at least have something to defend herself. And when I sent that to her, she was like, mama, it's illegal to spray somebody with wasp spray. And I'm like, that will keep them 20 feet away from you. And when the police get there, you swear to God, they were covered in wasp and you were saving their life. I'm like, you have to, defend. I mean, she wouldn't break the law, yeah. you know? Yeah. And, um, but you could tell, you could hear it in her voice that she was just, she was just, down some dark hole. It was just tragic. Well, it's, I mean, it was such an interesting, interesting, scary time for all of us. Like none of us knew Mm -hmm. what was really happening around that. And I imagine, you know, I've been to New York a few times and to, to imagine that place shut down in the way that you're talking about, like it probably felt like being in the twilight zone. Like I could 
certainly mm-hmm. understand why anxiety would start to become an issue. And uh, honestly, like even your perception of reality at that point, like mm-hmm. we, there was a lot of very, very strange moments around all that. Um, how long did she stay there? She came back in April of May or May of 2021. We were begging her to come back. We were begging every time we talked to her, we would just beg her to come home because we were scared to death uh, with her heart condition and her asthma and everything. All the hospitals up there were shut down. And in fact, the hotel that she worked in, that was where the first responders ended up coming in and staying was in the hotel that she worked in. Oh, wow. And wow. so she was seeing all this firsthand. She was seeing these workers and stuff. And when uh, she called me one time and she was very upset because uh, she said, Mama, I've been walking past this truck and there was this odor and it was terrible. And she said, and I was walking to work and I noticed all these police cars and stuff and come to find out that that truck that she had been walking past was full of people that had died and the refrigerator had gone out on it. And she had been walking past this truck. And, you know, so for her, that was just more on top. So when she came back from New York, she would shake, her hands would shake and she would, she would wear the face mask. And even in the house, we couldn't get her to take the mask off. And we would tell her, we would say, you're safe, Kate. You're okay, baby. It's, you're okay. And she would just say, it's not safe. It's not safe. And it was, it was a desperate time for us to see her like that when she was always the bravest little girl because of everything that she went through being sick and stuff. You know, I would watch her when doctors would be taking blood and when they would be doing tests and stuff, she would just be so brave and to see her broken and rattled and shaking was really hard for us. So was it, I mean, was it clear to you guys at that time that we, you were dealing with something more than just the effects of what COVID was doing to the country? I mean, she stuck it out. She was there for over a year in that environment, dealing with first responders, seeing all these sites. But then when she comes home, she won't even take her mask off. Like, did, did that give you guys some inclination about like this is something else is happening here? Um. You know, in retrospect, I would like to say, yeah, you know, I, that I recognized and, but I clearly, you know, and honestly didn't yeah. catch it to the degree that I should have. I, I, we did have one night when she was, uh, after she returned home, and she was going to drive across town to her sister's house and uh, to spend the night. And so she left here and she was only gone a few minutes and we got a phone call from somebody about halfway across town in Lumberton's a small town. It's only about a 10 minute drive. So it's only you know, five minutes. We get a phone call. Uh, we need to come check, come check on your daughter. We, she pulled up on the side of the road and there was a little business that was still open. We went down there and she was standing in the office of this little business where these people were, and she was having an anxiety attack. That was, that was clearly, you know, a serious deal. And she said to me, daddy, I don't want to die. And I said, baby, you're not going to die. You're not going to die. And, and, but, in her state of mind, her mother uh, put her in the car and took her to the hospital and, and let her let her run because of her heart condition. You know, make sure everything's OK. And everything was OK. It was simply it was an anxiety attack, a serious one. So at that point, then I was, uh, yeah, she's got, you know, some serious mental health things going on that she needs to to uh, now. Again, I didn't know how to I didn't know how to navigate that. I'm, I'm not. Right educated in those things and she had never had anything like that no. before never yeah before. she was fearless she was uh we, we made a trip to astral world the last year that it was open and she was still little and she would get so agitated because she wasn't tall enough for you know a particular ride yeah you know she wanted to ride the fastest tallest ride she wanted to you know when she was little she would climb the tree at her grandmother's house and uh, scare her yeah. mama to death because she climbed too high in the tree and you know yeah. there, there was nothing she was scared of growing up so to see her uh, fearful like that and, and that anxious, that kind of an anxiety attack was, uh, it was, it was scary. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Um, uh, the other well, the part, you know, John, maybe I'm getting ahead of you. I don't know, but yeah. just while I'm thinking of it. Um, so at some point she did go to a therapist and eventually a psychiatrist. She got this past January where she was diagnosed with 
uh, the PTSD, the ADHD, and the, the depression. And that's where the prescription medication got started with Ritalin and, and Zoloft. Okay. And, um, but what I, I'm just saying that to say this, both sides of our family, we do have a history. Uh, one of my mother's sisters, particularly, and then my wife has a sister that had uh, bipolar. 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 Disorder. And, you know, very uh, serious cases of bipolar. Yeah. And so. And you guys know, I mean, believe, that can take, that could take years to diagnose. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I, I just believe, and, and some of the other things we've learned along this road over the last five months about mental health, that if that's what she was dealing with, that this, what well, this shouldn't have been the medication she was on at all anyway. Right. Right. And this medication was not good for a person that has a heart condition and Kay has a serious heart condition. What, what condition is that? I've, I've heard you mention it. A she few has times. a ventricular septal defect with AFib. So her heart goes into AFib. Um, she has a hole in her heart and it's pretty large. And um, they were going to do heart surgery on her when she was four years old. Um, but they realized there's like a little flap there. And they realized that if they did the heart surgery, that it was going to maybe cause more problems than if they didn't because she was still functioning. And um, so they decided we're not going to do the heart surgery. We're going to watch her and stuff. We'll come to find out um, as we went through this journey, that's the heart condition that my grandfather had. And they actually did heart surgery on him at 36 and he died at 42. I have two sisters that have this same heart condition and they both have pacemakers. And then I have a nephew with the same heart condition. So it's a genetic issue for our family. Gotcha. And, gotcha. Um, we did so, have um, a commenter named Claire Bradley 101. Um, Cause I know in the first video we talked about the Zoloft and Ritalin combination. I found an article that said that it's a risky combination. I know you had spoken to family members that said those shouldn't be taken together. Uh, Claire Bradley 101 said, Hey, John, just for context, I've taken Zoloft and Ritalin safely for years. These two medications can be mixed and are mixed frequently with doctor's approval. Claire does note that a heart arrhythmia uh, no matter what should be checked for and that there sh she should have had an EKG before being put on those medications. Do you know if any of that happened? Were they aware of? Her, um, her heart we have, yeah, we have no idea. And her doctor is not talking to us because of HIPAA. He, he has cloaked himself in HIPAA. He wouldn't even tell us that he was her doctor. And I told him that we knew that he was her doctor because his name was on the prescription bottles and I said, he said, well, I don't, I'm, I can't talk to you about that. And I said, well, the Harris County Sheriff's Department is going to call you to talk to you. And he said, oh, they never do when this happens. And at that moment, I knew that this doctor had done this to another patient. He had to have to know that they would never call him in this situation. Yeah, that's it. And I said to him, I said, so what I hear you saying is that you've had another patient that you have met over medicated and they have had a police interaction. And he said, I can't speak to that because they have fucked. That was a very, very strange statement for you guys to hear. And I, I can't believe right. they would even say that. Um, so uh, rewinding just a little bit, when was the last time that you spoke to her? So I had called her the week before we had gone. Uh, she had lost her house key. And so we had gone that weekend and got, or the weekend before we'd gone and got keys made. Uh, my key was bent and he needed a new key. So we had gone to the M&D hardware store and got keys made. And we got Kaylana a key made with a cherry on it. So I called her and I told her, I'm like, oh, we got you a new key for the house. And it's got cherries. And she was super excited. And I said, we're going to hang it by the door. And when you get here, that way you don't forget it. <laughs> uh, it'll be hanging right there at the door. And that key is still hanging at the door, waiting on her to come get her key to the house. Uh, so we had talked to her like that Friday before the Wednesday before that, I had actually taken her to eat lunch. And, um, but that Monday, 
before she went missing, her sister had talked to her on like FaceTime with her kids and stuff. And Kaylana was just talking about her boyfriend and how much she loved him and how, how good things were. And Laren had called her dad and just talked about how awesome it was to hear Kay so happy. And we, we credit James with kind of bringing Kay out of some of the, the issues she was having because he would, He's so soft spoken and he just he has just loved her through. I've seen her like you could see that she was getting upset and he would just reach out and just touch her and just calm her. And hmm. so we know that he loves her and she loved, love, love, love Sam. How long? Know? How long have they been together? A, a little over a year. Okay. And um yeah, I remember the day that she came one day and she was smiling and everything and she was walking up the, the porch. And we always like if I know my kids are coming over, we usually sit out on the porch and wait for them to get here. And so she was walking up the steps and she said, Mama, there's this guy. And I said, oh, I said, do you like him? And she said, yeah, I like him. And I said, does he like you? And she said. Yeah, I think he does. Mm. And that was the first time that we had seen her, you know, that I'd seen her with kind of a light in her eyes and kind of be excited. And then um, just watching her want to do stuff for him. I've, I've always decorated cakes and they've always decorated cakes. And so James is a photographer and she decided that she wanted to make a cake for his birthday that matched his camera. And so we spent a day making a cake that looked like James's camera and um, trying to figure out how to make the lens and, and stuff like that. So, you know, she truly loves James and James truly loves her. And they, they, they really, they, they have such a wonderful relationship. It sounds like she keeps some pretty good relationships, uh, including with her friend, Brittany. Right. And that's, yes. Yeah. That's part of what, ties into this story is she at some point goes to see Brittany. Have you spoken to Brittany? Has she given you any insights into that visit or? So Brittany, Brittany is here a lot. Um, Brittany has been Kaylana's best friend since they were in high school. Kaylana was homeschooled until she went to, to uh, her freshman year of high school and she met Brittany and Cortland and they just kind of became inseparable. And so Brittany's like one of our kids. Mm. She she's here. We have family nights and they all come and eat. And so that's been really hard for us is we're used to having those family nights where Brittany and her husband come. And that's part of the New York thing, too. Uh, Brittany and Viet got married while Kay was in New York and she was supposed to be a bridesmaid. Uh -huh. And her job, they got married on October the 31st of 2020. And her company said, you'll have to quarantine for two weeks before. And then when you come back, you'll have to quarantine for two more weeks. And Brittany was like, you can't do that. That's a month of pay. And mm -hmm. I just felt like if Kay had come home then, she probably wouldn't have gone back to New York. Yeah. So she missed being in Brittany's wedding and they, they kind of did the zoom thing so that she was sort of there, but you know, COVID made her miss a lot of things. And, and so Kay would go and spend the night anytime Brittany had some, some project that she was working on or Kay had a project she was working on. Kay would go and stay at Brittany's house and to help her work on this project. And so Brittany said, when Kay had come on the 8th, that she could tell that, that Kay just didn't look right and wasn't, it was like there was something wrong. And so she she said, you know, what's going on? And she said, my, um, my doctor changed my medication. I haven't slept in two days. And Brittany said later she found out that it was probably like four days that Kay hadn't slept. And so Brittany's like, well, you just need to go sleep. And 
part of the problem with K is, and my family has this where everybody, my grandmother was nocturnal. I have sisters and my dad, you know, a lot of people are nocturnal in my family. And so she would stay up all night and sleep during the day. And that kind of worked good with homeschooling. Yeah. And um, so Brittany on the morning of the ninth, Brittany got up and knocked on the door of the room that Kay, Kay has her own room at Brittany and Viet's house, knocked on the door and Kay didn't answer. And Brittany was like, okay, good. She's sleeping. And so Brittany went to work thinking Kay's sleeping and stuff. And then when Brittany gets home, She's still trying to find out. She's still trying to call around and trying to find Kay and find out what's going on because Kay's not there. And she checks her ring camera. And that is when she discovers that there is something seriously wrong going on because Kaylana is on her ring camera and she looks bewildered. Like she can't figure out how to get back in the house. Kay knows all the codes to Brittany's house. They literally, we always joke that they share a brain. She knows all the codes, but Brittany also said that her garage was open. So all Kay would have had to done was walk into the garage and get into the house. But Kay is on the ring camera trying to figure out how to get into the house. And uh, so Brittany starts trying to text and call Kay then Brittany gets a text message from Kaylana that says no help. Right. Well, at that point, Brittany is panicked. And so she's trying and trying and trying to call. And I don't know if Kay called Brittany back or Brittany finally got a hold of Kay. If Kay finally answered the phone. But Brittany said, you texted no help. And she said, I'm okay. I'm okay. And for Kaylana, when things were happening, she would always, that was her go-to. I'm okay. And um, she said, I'm okay. I'm just driving around. And Brittany said, she said, my phone is dying. And Brittany's like, take down my number. Cause Brittany knew that Kay didn't know her number right. because people, kids put numbers in their phones. They never dial a number. Yep. They don't know numbers. Yep. And so, uh, Brittany, the phone went dead. Brittany immediately calls James, Kaylana's boyfriend, and says, hey, can you go look for Kay? She said she's just driving around. So James literally runs, jumps in his car and starts driving around Beaumont. And he's out till two o'clock in the morning, driving to all the places where Kay plays music, the places where they go and drink coffee. You know, there's a couple of nighttime coffee shops and stuff. Um, so he was like trying to hit all these spots where possibly Kaylana could be and couldn't find her. And so by two o'clock in the morning, he had to go to work the next morning. He just assumed maybe she'd come here to sleep or she was staying at another friend's house. And so he went home. So the next morning at 10 o'clock in the morning, Brittany calls me and she is panicked. She is so upset. And I literally, I've never seen Brittany upset. Just, Things happen. They've done tons of projects. They have completely fallen apart here. And I've never seen Brittany get upset, but I could hear it in her voice. And she said, I can't find Kay. Her locator is off on her phone. I can't find her. And so she told me about everything that had gone on. And so I said, okay. Uh, so I took off work. I, I do childcare in my home. I called the baby's grandmother to come get them. I called Robbie at his work and he said maybe she decided to go to Austin because she'd gone to South by Southwest last year and managed to talk her way into Willie Nelson's VIP party and had hit a bunch of VIP parties where she wouldn't even supposed to get in. And South by Southwest was starting in Austin that weekend. And so that was his suggestion. So I hung up with him and called Brittany and said, call her friend in Austin and see if maybe he has heard from her. So by this point, I'm already in Beaumont. I'm driving around looking for her. And Brittany calls me back and says, he said that she called him last night. She was on her way to his house, that she was in Hockley, Texas, and her phone was at 3%. And so at that point, I'm already in Beaumont. I go to Robbie's work and he takes off work and we head 
to Hockley, Texas. We've never heard of Hockley, Texas, never been there, don't know anything about Hockley, Texas, but you can Google anything. So meantime, Brittany says she is filing a missing persons report in Her in Hardin County, which is where we live. So we're on the way to Hockley and I called the Austin Police Department and asked them to please go to Kaylana's friend's house and do a well check because I had talked to him and he said he had talked to Harris County, which none of that made sense. He talked to Harris County and they said they were looking for her. Okay. None of that made sense to us. And so we're driving and the whole time we're driving, uh, the Austin police officer is asking for information. So I'm sending like by this time, James has taken off work and he's at at home and he's going through all of Kaylana's paperwork. So he's like sending us her checking account stuff. He's sending us pictures. He's sending us everything he can get his hands on her registration for her car, everything. And um, I am sending this to the police officer in Austin. Okay. And um, we had just made it to Hockley. We thought we were going to Hockley to find her run out of gas. Right. You know, Right. with a dead cell phone. And um, we had just got to a McDonald's in Hockley and my phone rings and it's the Austin police officer. And she said, what he said was true. Harris County is looking for her. They were looking for her with a dog and a helicopter. And she said, I hate to tell you this. And she said, good luck, you know, and I up with her immediately, immediately called Harris County and it took forever to get through. Finally, they got me through to an officer. And the first thing after I told him who I was and what was going on that we were looking for Carolina, he said, is your daughter homeless? And I said, no, sir, she is not. And he's like, well, her car is full of bags of clothes. And I said, yes, sir. I know that because she had rented a new house and got bed bugs and so she was literally it took her six weeks to fight the bed bugs and she has a vintage clothing business. So she had taken all her vintage clothing to the laundromat to wash. And so her car was also full of laundry detergent and dryer sheets and stuff like that because she couldn't even do her business. Yeah. Until after she had made sure that all the bed bugs were eradicated. So then once I told him that, then he said, well, she's a drug addict. And I said, no, sir, she is not. I said she has a heart condition. She is not a drug addict. And he's like, well, um, she had a. Uh, why would she have run from the police? And I'm like, I have no idea. And so I'm asking him if he will come and meet with us. And he says he's getting off work and he gives us the address of where this happened at. And so we put that in Google and we start heading that way. And so, Robbie, you can go. Well, no, I mean, I didn't know at this point. That's that's a lot of information in a very short period of time. I don't know if you have any questions about anything she's asked. Well, so. yeah, I mean, um, and really it's giving us the perspective of what you guys went through in that, that time frame. And I just have a, one thing, which I don't think I noted, but I had a question of when I was looking at the materials last time was the sheriff breaks her driver's side window, driver's side, right? Yes. Her driver's, her driver's side, side window with a two by four. Yeah. I've never heard yeah. of that before. I've, I, I've heard of them trying to break a window to stop a driver or something. Well, and even in then, like, I don't know if it would be in this type of situation. You've got someone parked in someone's driveway and like, I mean, the whole thing is just kind of odd. Can you give me a little more insight? Have you guys figured out anything about that? Well, just what we were told by the residents that were there that day, their description of the events as they unfolded, uh, the actual word, Description two by four is in the police report. That's, that's that. from their police report. Yeah. That we found out they used the two by four. But at any rate, uh, when the police arrived there, the sheriff's deputies from Harris County, when they got there and started trying to get into her car, she continued to lock her. Now, keep in mind, it's about 530. It's not daylight yet. Initially, she was approached by the lady of the house in the driveway where she was parked. She wouldn't wake up. 
she called the, I think she probably called the homeowners association first and then called somebody else called uh, 911. We were told there was a off the record constable there. When we checked with the precinct four constable's office, they say, no, we weren't present, but we've been told there was a constable there. Okay. Officially it's Harris County Sheriff's department or the two deputies that were there that, uh, interacted with her. So by the time they got there to wake her up, uh, she woke up. She had previously been in another driveway right next door earlier that morning. And those people, when they came home, had tapped on her window when she, she started the car and moved over to the driveway where all this happened at. Okay. So we believe that when she woke up, she simply thought they wanted her to move again. This is again, this is just our speculation based on what we know. Sure. Because she moved out of the driveway and was going to drive back down the street. This was in a cul-de-sac. There was only one way out. When she got to the, when she started trying to leave, the homeowners association president had blocked the road with his car, and he was parked at the corner. And that's where we have a picture of her, an up close picture of her looking directly at him. And you can tell in that picture that she is out of it as far as her mental state. And she also is showing uh, signs of her heart condition because her lips are discolored. They're, they're blue. They are completely blue. So from there, since she can't get out, she turned around and drove back to the driveway she started in and drove across their yard to a picket fence and stopped there. And then she we're not we're unclear. I think that this may be where the two by four comes into play, but it may be a little bit later because she, she eventually drives through the picket fence into the next yard. There's another barbed wire fence there. So the, the two by four could have been used in either one of these locations. We're not sure which. Okay. But at any rate, the deputy picked up a two by four when he couldn't get in and they he busted her driver's side window to gain access to the car. They said that she was continually locking her her door like she wasn't stopping locking it. And when he was trying to get in her door, she was continually pushing the lock button, which if you're an officer, I would think that that would mean that you would realize that this person is panicked. We believe they, you know, that they, we believe that in their zeal to gain control of the situation, they miss the fact that they're dealing with somebody where we need to dis de escalate rather than escalate. Well, and someone by. that might be having a medical event, by the way, like we, we know now that there's even more, we've already got, you know, such strong potential for a mental health issue going on here but a physical health issue as well um yeah and the car how far is it from the driveway where they come up and they wrap on her window to where her car stops about what's that distance it was point, it was 0.46 miles basically a half mile, a half mile. Call it a half mile. and we walked it multiple times once all this you know once because later in the day and the next day we walked down to the car multiple times and she rosa walks my wife walks every day about five miles and so she's pretty good at distances and she has an app so we clocked it to see how clocked far it with was. the app to see how and far it was, was. any rate so they bust the window with the two by four like that again is in the police report that's their verbiage two by four and at when we went downtown later or several days later i went downtown and filed a complaint against the sheriff's department because of all of this activity and when I was talking to the officer that took my report, he referred to that as a tool of convenience. So you can, you can write that one down if you want to. Yeah. Because no, no. I was asking the uh, the I know because we have law enforcement people in our family, and I know that there's a tool that they have that it's no bigger than your hand that you can bust the window out with no trouble. Yeah. Yeah. So why did he use the two by four? Right. And his explanation was it was a tool of convenience, and not every officer has one of those window breaking tools so anyway i mean they would have a nightstick i mean there's there's I'm, I'm sure there's several other items on their belt that they could pull from like it's just it's a very strange image it paints in my mind of some oh here's a two by four on the ground i'm gonna i mean you're gonna swing that thing like a baseball bat towards a window with a, a young lady on the other side of it like it just, i don't know it's it's a very strange move i get that yeah. things are escalating there's property damage that's happening now 
uh, he's not sure. Well, that was one of the things was that the homeowner said that she thought that Kay was going to hit her car and she didn't. She like backed up very carefully and didn't hear her car. She said, we thought she was going to hit our pump house and she backed up away from our pump house because Kay knew that that was. And the man in the second yard that she ended up in, he had an outbuilding and he said, I don't know how she missed that outbuilding, but she went all the way around the outbuilding and it was very that the alleyway where she would have had to go was very, she was very careful not to damage people's property. Hmm. And so the fact that she went through, I thought after talking to the police officer and the way that he was telling me, you know, that she was going to go in jail a long time and that she had done a lot of property damage and stuff. I thought she had run through these people's house. Right. Literally. That is what I thought had happened. What was he saying that she was going to go to, to jail for? I mean, property damage. Um, he you pay said for that it. she had evaded arrest, that she had attempted to run over a police officer. Now, bear in mind, she didn't attempt to hit a car. She didn't attempt to hit a well house. She didn't attempt to hit an outbuilding. Why would she have attempted to run over a police officer? Yeah. She wouldn't have done that. Yeah. None of that makes sense. And the people in the neighborhood were like, they said she was never going more than three or four miles an hour. And you know, so none of that made sense to us. You know, we have a girl that's never even had a parking ticket. And all of a sudden they're accusing her of being a homeless drug addict. And they told the homeowner that she was a homeless drug addict with warrants. They hadn't even run her license plate yet. They didn't run her license plate until they were down at her car where her car was bogged down. How could they have told the homeowner that? It was, that was a, uh... She was uh, a lot of presumption on their part when they pulled up there that morning. They, they, yeah. they. I don't like the term profiled, but she was profiled by the what they what they looked at, and what yeah. they thought they were dealing with. It sure sounds like it. Um. Anyway, back to the two by. So once the window was broken uh, with the two by four, she accelerated through the barbed wire fence. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that's where that must have happened was at the barbed wire fence. She accelerated through the barbed wire fence into the cow pastures, which is. There was two cow pastures separated by another barbed wire fence. That barbed wire fence that separates, she actually found a gap to go through. She didn't run through that fence. She was, you know, <laughs> cognitive enough yeah. to know to go find a place to get through the fence, and she did. Um, so that was about two thirds of the journey was through these two cow pastures, and then into the woods for the final third of the journey. Okay. Uh, how many? And how many sheriffs were on hand for this interaction? Do you know? Two. 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 Yeah. Have you spoken and, to them? Uh, no. And we've asked to speak to Ed Gonzalez, who is the sheriff of Harris County, and he's refusing to meet with us. Uh, they they keep saying it's going up the chain of command, but they have a missing, a broken link somewhere because we've been asking for almost a hundred and you know, 120 days or something oh, like that. We've yeah. been asking almost from the start to meet with him. So um, he, we haven't talked to anybody other than her missing persons detective. Yeah. And yeah. Um, it's 144 it's, days as of today. It's 145. Yeah. Today is 145. 145. Yes. Um, commenter Carolyn Sterland, 3126, asks a great question. Has body cam footage been released of the interaction with law enforcement? No. They will not release that to anybody so far. It's been asked for by multiple people, including um, one of the Houston television stations that has been helping us, uh, Fox 26 News. They were turned down. Uh, people working with us that have asked for it have been turned down. Um, I mean, that's what this stuff is for. And, and it's actually... Other, other law enforcement agencies have asked for have, it and, been and been turned down. And uh, yeah, Hardin County has asked for it because the original missing persons uh, was filed here in Hardin County. Uh, but their answer is it's an active investigation. That's their shield. That, and I don't know if that's legally, uh, you know. And I, uh, do you I know what the charges are against her? It's the evading arrest. They weren't there to arrest her. That's the that's the thing about it. They weren't there to arrest her. Yeah. But they have her on evading arrest sure. and um, the 
whatever the, the almost hitting the police officer fleeing, fleeing, fleeing or, and then yeah. yeah and then the but um, like attempted bodily to, harm or something to identify failure to identify that she didn't tell them who she was when they were uh trying to bust her window out with the two by four that she didn't stop and tell them who she was um they had they actually had five warrants uh, three felony and two misdemeanors. And the homeowners actually had filed for uh, their filed against her insurance before we even got there. We were there within, we were probably there by one or two o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. They had already filed a claim on her insurance. What homeless drug addict has insurance? And they have been paid. Both homeowners that had property damage have been paid. And so we thought that would give Harris County and out to say, okay, we can drop these charges. But no, now they're going to use those two um, that they're not using for that as to back up their other claim. Right. As long as they just keep claim. one charge, then they, they can keep this. Hey, we've got an active investigation. We can't release those, mat- which doesn't right. even make sense. Have you, have you looked into, have you gotten any legal advice, looked into any records act type well, stuff? Yeah. We really haven't, as far as we for ourselves, for us, we do have uh, representation for her okay. when we find her. Okay. And we've been told by that lawyer that when we find her, that he doesn't think it'll be a problem at all. He thinks this will go away rather quickly and easily. Um, he doesn't see it as a big problem, but we have to find her. First. We have to find her. But you're right. It's it's time at, that we as her parents need to find some legal representation to push through some of this other yeah tape. yeah because we're we're this is this is too long this is going on too long you know if, if we were talking three days after the fact and having this conversation then yeah I'd, I'd be with you maybe it's not time yet but at the point that they have materials that could be helpful in terms of understanding what happened on the day of a disappearance of someone that is now missing for 145 days turn it over and outside of that there's there's public issues that are going on here you have all these homeowners that were affected uh that those materials that body cam footage in particular should be released where i live uh we actually have laws here that if there's a shooting an officer involved shooting it has to be turned over to the public so it's it's just a much different situation it sounds like um from state to state well they allowed the homeowners like um there were at least two of the homeowners that walked down to Kailana's car with the police officers. And when they got to the one fence, the officers, like they had to urge the officers to go after Kay. And then when they got to that last fence before they got to her car, the officers stopped and they said, we don't know if we can go any farther than this. And they said, are you kidding me? Because at this point they've labeled her as a homeless yeah. drug addict. And they said, y'all are chasing a, somebody running from y'all, you have the authority to do this. So they literally had to urge them to go down to Kailana's car. And when they went down to Kailana's car, we have the video and I talked to Kailana's uh, missing person detective. And he said, well, they didn't know what they were dealing with, but they literally have a gun pulled on Kailana's car. And then they swing the gun out towards the woods. And that was taken by one of the homeowners that was there. And they said, they literally, they did not go into those woods. They called for a helicopter and a dog. They did not go into those woods to look for Kailana. You have a girl in a long, hot pink dress, and they knew she was barefooted because her shoes were right there. Yeah. They knew she was barefooted, and they didn't go after her. Who does that? Tell me about the um, the woods that she goes running off into. Are we talking pretty rough terrain? Is it easy to get through? Is What's it like? It's um, I don't know if you're familiar with the, the term big thicket yeah. here in Texas. This area we live in is known as the big thicket. And that's literally what it is. When you go into the woods anywhere, anywhere that the property has not been improved, that's what you have. You have big trees, but then you have undergrowth that is just just thick. You, yeah. If you don't have a machete, you're not getting through it. Now, where she bogged her car down was right next to what is uh, is Spring Creek, and Spring Creek divides Harris County and Montgomery County. And she got right along there, the little trail she was on had been cut by whoever owned that property, that property owner, uh, like a little ranch or farm, you know, 
and they had cut a, a path into those woods up to where that car was bogged down. And so it was a little a little clearing there that she could get to that creek. And she crossed the creek on a log, went over into Montgomery County, and when she came up on the other side, uh, it wasn't quite that thick right there at the creek, and she could find she would have been able to find her way to another uh, lane that the property owner on that side had cut right alongside. The, so it wasn't as thick right there. And um, where we believe she went, she would have followed that slight clearing, I'll call it, lane very up past another house up to the road uh, that adjoined that property on that side of the creek. On the Montgomery County side. Now, okay. as far as her just cutting in through the woods, it would be like I've described, the big thicket. It, for anybody to just think they're going to run through the woods and get anywhere is nearly impossible. You'd be cut up. You, your clothes would be torn to shreds. Uh, you know, without a machete, you wouldn't get through it at all. And and so yeah. there, there's never been a so much as a thread of that pink dress found anywhere in those woods where anybody has searched. So everyone's belief to this point is that she crossed that creek, followed that clearing, that lane along that other, by that other house across the creek, and made it to that road through that clearing. Um, but she disappeared. She, you know, there, there is no, no sighting, no other sighting of her since that, since that time. Unbelievable. And we, we literally, when they told us the, the lady at that home told us where they thought she'd come out on the other side. And me and Robbie drove around on the Montgomery side, Montgomery County side. And I was literally crawling through that bramble and those bushes. And I was cut up. I was wearing shorts. I was wearing a short sleeve shirt and I was, crawling through that stuff. And I was screaming Kaylana's name at the top of my lungs, looking for her. And he was doing the same thing, going down that lane and going down the creek. And we were screaming. And the lady, the homeowner there, I'm going to tell you, the people in Montgomery County are the kindest, most wonderful people. The Tomball people, they have rallied around us. They have just been the most wonderful people. We owe them a debt of gratitude. We'll never be able to repay them for all the help that they've given us throughout this whole ordeal because they have literally run to go look for our daughter. If somebody said they thought they saw her, you'd have like five or six people jumping in a car driving to where that, that was. Yeah. So this community is one of the best communities in the world. And that lady at that house that morning was out there or that afternoon was out there with us screaming Kaylana's name. She allowed us to go through her barns and all of her outbuildings. But yeah, yeah, they are. They're great people there. But I guess in a nutshell, where she crossed that creek, she had very limited capacity to go anywhere other than the direction of that road. Right. Right. Try to fight her way through that thicket would have been near impossible. Yeah. Do you so know, is that, that road, us, is that a high traffic area? Would there have been regular travel happening on that road? Yeah, that time of the morning, um, it is a road that connects two major freeways in that area. On one end, it connects to Highway 2920, and on the other end, Highway 249. And so it's a, there's a lot of construction, residential construction in that part. You know, you think of Houston as it, you know, the urban, urban sprawl or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. It just continues to go up, grow outward. Uh, and so there's a lot of new residential uh, area out there, new construction going on. And that, that road is used uh, for, by commuters, you know, okay. trying to get to one of the major freeways to get to work in the morning or to get home in the evening. So that time of morning, uh, you know, we're guessing 6 to 6.30, I guess. She would have made it to yes. that road. Okay. Yeah. There should have been quite a bit of, you know, a considerable amount of traffic on that road. You would think that a girl in a hot pink dress would stand out. Yeah. Especially if she was frantic. Right. With no shoes. No shoes. Yeah. Nope. Um, how confident are we about the search efforts from the spot from her car to that clearing to the road? Like how many how many searchers have we had out there? I know EquiSearch has been assisting. Have they checked that specific area or are they looking in other places? Now that that particular area has been searched, I'm going to say four or five times now. Okay. Uh, twice, twice my equal search, uh, and there's been at least three other lesser known, you know, some some just private people that have searched on their own. There's been one pretty good organized search that uh, Harris County actually did a search 
they found out we were going to have a search going on. Uh, someone had organized a search. And so they said, can y'all wait? Let us go search first. And, and so they're they brought old. their dogs in. Yeah, they brought cadaver dogs to do that search because their, you know, their worst nightmare would be for these volunteer searchers to find a body out there. Which, by the way, is most of the time what happens. But it's, it's interesting because I hear this story every now and then, too, that volunteers will get together to do a search and law enforcement will tell them not to because either they're going to go search again or they'll just tell them not to, period. But yeah. So. Well, they didn't call that morning. They did not call Montgomery County for three hours. So had they called Montgomery County and we've been on that road, we have passed out thousands of flyers right there on that road where she would have possibly came out at. Yeah. And in that time, we have not seen one single police officer out there. We've only seen one ambulance. Mm. You know, there, it is no man's land. There are no police officers out there. So there is no chance that she would have been spotted by a police officer that was just driving around. They needed to have called Montgomery County to have somebody out there from Montgomery County. And had they called Montgomery County, I believe that Kailana would have run to that police car and she would have said, somebody is chasing me. Somebody busted my window out. Please help me. Yeah. And that was that was taken away from her that morning. Uh, Robbie, in one post that you left on the first video, you mentioned that Harris County Sheriff's Office continues to push their narrative of that morning. I just want to know what parts of their narrative do you feel are not accurate? Hmm, it's a good question. Um, I think they maintain the perspective that they're dealing with uh, a fugitive rather than a missing person. And what really the frustration is that their desire to continue to treat her as a fugitive and maintain those warrants cuts us off at the knees. And then in this way, it, well, number one, it kept Equisearch out of the game for far too long until Equisearch finally, uh, and I, I don't know the details on how this happened, I just got a call and said, we're not watching from the sidelines anymore. We're coming back in. So I don't know what the conversation was between them and Harris County, yeah. but yeah. at the end of the day, they're back in and we're so thankful for that because they know what they're doing. And, uh, but at any rate, the warrants kept them on the sidelines for, you know, the, the initial 48 to ever how many hours, the most important hours, they were sidelined by those warrants. The other thing the warrants do is they, they, hamper our efforts to get media coverage for K. Hmm. Um, traditional media won't touch the story because one called Harris County and and they get, well, she's just a felon or she's a, a fugitive. fugitive and she's got warrants. Right. Well, you just lost any grace or any, you know, goodwill you might have had with traditional media right there. They're not going to go up against, especially in Houston, the Houston media uh, are not going to go up against Harris Harris County Sheriff's Department. Sure. Uh, and that's so what, that's what makes Gabby, Gabby Hart with Fox 26. That's what has made her so amazing to us because we were even scared to talk to her. She does a program called The Missing yeah. and we were scared to talk to her because of all of this. And she said, I don't care about any of that. And she has been fighting for us. And so, yeah, she's big, not that at all. big right. props to, to Gabby for her work. Um, my researcher that pulled this case together for us to produce our segment, uh, it was the first note that I saw. I was like, John, this Gabby Hart person is amazing and what she's doing to help this <laughs> she case. She is. Yeah, yeah. So thank you she so much, Gabby. Awesome. Yeah. She really is. Um, and and what, I'm, I'm sorry, but just to finish the thought on this, why that's so important, John, is when we're standing out there on that road handing out flyers or standing in a parking lot handing out flyers, when we were at you know, our 20,000th flyer, we've been online. We got the updates for Kalana Turner page. It's got over 10,000 followers now. And yet one out of five flyers or two out of five flyers, you hand to somebody and they look at you and go, I haven't heard about this. I didn't even yeah. know this was going on. Yeah, I know. it. On and, and, Road. and those are people that might watch the TV news or if there is such a thing as a newspaper anymore, maybe read a newspaper, right? Right, right. Traditional media 
has been sidelined because when they called to get Harris County side of the story, their perspective is, oh, that's just the future. That's not a missing person. Move along. Nothing to see here. Uh, commenter Zane5337 puts it pretty succinctly. I think once law enforcement was advised of her having a mental episode, they should have taken down the warrants and tried to help this family. And I don't know. I don't think any of the viewers out there watching this right now would argue with that. There's uh, such... We, we have a pattern. You guys have told us the story. We understand that there has been some type of escalation that happened with her mental health issues. She has medication. You guys found her doctor because of the medication bottles. Like, how can law enforcement just ignore these obvious signs that something like this was happening there and keep these warrants active? I don't, I don't get it. When we told him, when I told, because we had to file a new missing persons with Harris County because Hardin County said because she'd been spotted in Harris County, they closed the missing person that we filed in Hardin County. Right. And so we're filing a new missing persons with Harris County that night. And that officer, when I'm talking to him and I'm telling him that she has a heart condition and she needs to go to the doctor. And, you know, at this point, we're believing that they're going to find her within hours. They're going to find her, you know, that night. And um, I'm asking them, will they take her to the hospital? And he's like, we'll take her to the uh, the jail and we'll our doctors there will evaluate her. And I'm like, she has a cardiac condition. Uh, condition. She needs to see a real doctor. She is in danger. And they ignored every single plea that we made. And every single plea that I have made since then, when I talk to a Harris County Sheriff's deputy, their response is always the same. We'll take her to jail and we'll have her done. We'll, we'll evaluate her there. Montgomery County, we met with the Montgomery County um, mental health officer. He's like, our first thing will be, we take her to the hospital. Yeah. You know, yeah. we've met with Waller County. We've met with all the Tomball police. They're like, we're taking her to the hospital, yeah. you know, and Harris County continues to view her as this dangerous fugitive. And I mean, what is what is going on? Around, and why be so gruff with you guys about this? What is the benefit in that? Harris County continues to put out, oh, we found a dead body here. We found a dead body there. Well, I'm having to call and check on those dead bodies. And so I call because there's a dead body found and the officer that calls me back, I'm calling to check on a dead body to see if that's my kid. And he says, you know, your daughter has warrants and she's a fugitive. And I this said, is unbelievable. I was like, I was so upset. I was so upset. And I was trying to explain to him, but you can't explain it to them. You can't make them understand that she is in danger. I'm calling about a dead body and you're going to tell me that that she has warrants and she's a fugitive. I know that. I know that. Read the room, mister. Yeah. You know, and then um, the like a couple of nights after she went missing, we were going to every hospital. We were going everywhere. And I end up at a hospital and um, I have the flyers and our first flyers that we printed up, every single one of them had the Harris County Sheriff's Department phone number on them. Yeah. And so there's a Harris County Sheriff deputy there in the parking lot at the hospital. And I go up to him to take the flyer to him and talk to him about, hey, he puts his hands behind his back. He will not even touch the flyer. And he said, I know all about your daughter. He said, she is not missing. She is a fugitive. Who does that? All he had to do was take the flyer. But because he did that, we knew at that moment that Harris County could care less about Kaylana because he said, if we find her, we're taking her to jail. Does she have her car? So, no, she doesn't have a car. Has she been using her accounts? No, there's been no activity on her accounts. How can we make this assumption? What do they think that she went to Mexico? Like, honestly, they may have took her to Mexico. We don't know. What is the assumption here? It's just so it's it's out there. It's bizarre. And quite honestly, it's got me concerned that something else is at play here. That, that I mean, like, why? Why are we going to be this defensive about this? Well, John, I'm going to tell you that th this is something we have early on. And I, I, I'm I'm naive. I'm, you know, so I, I, I want to think the best of everybody. I want to think. 
And right. so all through this, we've actually tried to squash any anything that was negative or, you know, conspiracy theory or maybe this, or that. you know, we, we keep that tap down, you know, we're yeah. just looking for help. We just want to find our daughter. Yeah. It's 145 days and she's either been abducted by aliens, as far as I can tell, or something sinister may have happened. I don't know the answer and I'm not casting aspersions on anybody. Yeah. No, it's just, something it's maybe not... more than what we can tell. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's already a troubling situation. Look, I've looked into other cases uh, in tough areas like this in, in Texas. I'm, I don't know if you guys are aware of the Brandon Lawson case, but I know uh, Jason Watts, who was part of the team that found Brandon's remains. Uh, I literally was having a talk with him a few weeks ago and he's like, hey, John, you know that that uh, Kay Alana case? I think I'm going to need to go help them out. Um, those cases can be extremely tough and I'm worried. My, my big concern is that something happened in the woods there because I, I, I just don't know how she could have gotten anywhere outside of if something didn't happen in the woods there, she got to the road and then a bad situation happened from there. So, right. you know, it's, it's already tough from that angle. I don't understand the benefit of how the sheriff's department is handling it outside of is this a matter of it keeps them from having to do too much with this case? Maybe. Everything is on the table for us. Mm -hmm. Everything is on the table because she's been missing for so long. Everything, there's anything that could have happened to her. We're going to be working on legislation so that when somebody is missing, that their property can't be sold that they have to give it to the family that they can't say, oh, we can't give this to you because your name is not on the title. And then they can auction it off to a stranger. Yeah. What We're about in situations that? where that missing person turns out to be a homicide situation and you've now gotten rid of evidence that you need? I mean, right. And and we, we're assuming that they threw away everything that was in her car. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And um, Harris County told us that they had impounded her car. So we assumed that they had their hands on it in some part, but they couldn't figure out how to get it out of the woods. So the homeowner called and got it pulled out of his woods okay. and it was took to a, a lot. And so they called, they called and gave Robbie the number. Well, I called to check on it as soon as I had that number. And they told me that, but I still thought they told me that if, our name wasn't on the title or we weren't on the insurance or anything like that, that we could not get the car. And I said, well, can we pay on it? And they said, no, you can't do anything. And so I was like, OK, well, we still assumed that Harris County still had their hands on that car because that was her weapon that she supposedly right. tried to run a police officer with. Right. You know, right. no, they auctioned her car off. Her car is gone. You know. And Harris County said, well, we didn't have anything to do with it after it, after that homeowner had it pulled off his property. Had we known that, we have friends that have a wrecking service. Our friends would have come and pulled Kailana's car out of those woods. But they had told us they impounded her car. Yeah. You know. So what are your next steps? What are some things that you guys are working on right now in terms of the search for Kailana? So, um, I'm following up on every single lead. We're we're working closely with Texas EquiSearch. Uh, we're still passing out flyers. We've got uh, a man this week that they've got something going on in Austin. He's taking flyers and he's going to pass out there. Uh, we, I'm doing every single podcast. I'm talking to anybody that will talk to me. Okay. And trying to get her name out there because we feel like we do not get national coverage. We're not going to get any co any local coverage. Yeah. And so that's important to us. Uh, after what happened, it was very hard for us with the Carly uh, what was Russell. Russell case because oh. our local stations will not carry Kaywana's story. They right. will not carry it at all. And yet they spent three minutes on our local stations carrying this hoax. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And so that is very hard. As we were there Saturday, we're we're networking with all the people that we can. Anybody that might can give us a clue on things that we can do to help find our daughter. We're doing that. 
we're doing that. I sent a, a message to Dog the Bounty Hunter, yeah. you know, because they have her listed as a fugitive. I'm like, bring on the bounty hunters. You know, there's a reward for her. Come on down. The, um, the importance of Texas Equisearch being back on board with us is uh, they've also had her on 42 billboards around Texas. Uh, so that's great. They've got other tools in their toolbox that they utilize, but they got their own, uh, all the social media platforms. Uh, they've got her on there now. It was, it was uh, them, Texas Equisearch, that approached us about doing the video that I did asking people to search their own property, yeah. uh, which was a brilliant idea. Yeah. And so we were glad to get out. It's, it's, it's uh, difficult as it was, it was, it, it was a great tool. And uh, we've got a lot of good response from that. So and I don't, I'm sure they've got other tools in their toolbox maybe we don't know about. And I know that they also have uh, maps on the table uh, looking at options as to where to search areas that may not have been searched as thoroughly as they might have been. And they're willing to go back, and they've already done this, to ground zero, you know, ground that's already been covered, but maybe if it hasn't, hasn't been covered thoroughly by them, they're not satisfied with that. Yeah. They want it searched again. And so, you know, they're going back to start and starting there. So we're glad of that. So, yeah, and a big thank you to Texas Equisearch. Uh, they seem to have been a uh, very big help to you. Um, we've got... The, the citizens of Tomball that are stepping up, supporting you in every which way. Who are some other people that you would just like to say thank you to around all the efforts on this so far? Oh, well, thank you. Appreciate you oh, sure. uh, picking up the story and then doing your first video. We, we do appreciate that. And there's other uh, podcasters. Uh, Rosa has, uh, she's been able to tell the story to multiple podcasters. Uh, all of the, you asked about, Brittany earlier, I wanted to mention there's Brittany, there's our niece, Brianne, and there's the boyfriend, James. Those three, you know, they, 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 without them, we wouldn't be talking to you right now. Those three have been right there on the front lines this whole time. What coverage we've been able to get, um, they are the ones that built the updates for Kay Turner Facebook page and maintain that. They're the ones that built the link tree that gives people all the information in a concise, you know, one place where you can go to get all the information about this story. They've been on the streets with us, handing out flyers. Brittany has been amazing at capturing stuff. Anything that comes out with Kaylana's name on it, yeah. Brittany is capturing it. Brittany has all the police reports that came out. Now they're kind of holding that stuff tight to them. But Brittany was on it to start with. So that's how come we found out about the two by four was because Brittany got that form. They they were able to get the flight pattern for the helicopter. I mean, wow. Wow. Brittany and Brianne have been knocking it out of the park as far as trying to find anything they can to help Kaylana. Those three kids, I say kids, you know, they're 30, <laughs> whatever they are, you know, we're, we're like the progressive commercial with the old people. So <laughs> without them, we wouldn't be here. Yeah. The, the families of missing people have just come alongside of us and have helped us and, and told us things that maybe if we weren't doing it, that we needed to be doing this and we needed to be doing that. Yeah. And that's how we found out about the John and Joseph law. There's now Tim's law that's coming into effect uh, that has something to do with if law enforcement comes in contact with somebody that they don't just walk away from them because the last person that saw Steph's brother was law enforcement and they found his remains seven months later, like within two miles of those police officers. Mm. So there's a lot of new laws that are coming into effect to help families of the missing. And that is so important, important because we would have never thought, oh, you need to protect a missing person's belongings. And now we know that. So we're going to be working on legislation for that. Yeah. We're going to be working on um, HIPAA. I don't know if you know this, but if your family member is missing and you need to get a hold of their medical information, you can't. So we're going to need to be working on something to make sure that on their license, on, a, on somebody's license, that you can have a HIPAA contact. Yeah. That you can say, hey, if something happens to me, this family member can have all of my medical information. Right. I think right. that's key to be on a driver's license. You know, so there's things now that we know 
as a family of a missing person that we would have never dreamed or never known. And the stuff that we're learning is not going to help Kaylana, but it might help the next family that has a missing person. And that's one of our main goals is I'm, to help that next person. I'm absolutely confident that's the truth. Uh, even just doing what you're doing here in terms of sharing this information, raising these issues, there's other conversations that are going to spin from all this. And I just have to say one of the highlights, if you could say this, of my work is getting to hear about these stories about how people in similar situations share with each other, support each other, help each other in these really, really tough instances. And no one picks to be in this club that you guys are a part of. But I know that that love and support that you're seeing from all these others, that you guys are going to echo that to other people that need it as well. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I would um, just add to that. If we're giving props out. I want to, I will not. The community of faith that surrounds us is at the top. We would not be able to make this without our church family. Yeah. Uh, the community of faith that meets us at the corner when we're handing out a flyer and says, is it okay if we pray for you? Uh, a carload of Hispanic folks who get out that we can't even communicate with, but they want to pray in their language that we don't understand. And you feel the power of God in such a way that you know that he's hearing it yeah. and he's working. And the bottom line is, and I've told this to people, the faith that we work to instill in our children is now being tested. Did we believe it when we were teaching it to them? Or were we just giving lip service to it? Because where we're standing at today, did we really believe what we taught our children that it's going to carry us through and it'll get us through this? And we that's, that's where we stand, that God is faithful yeah. and he will get us through this. And so we're grateful for the community of faith that surrounds us and holds us up as we walk through this. One more thing that I forgot to mention, Kaylana speaks fluent Spanish. So it was it oh, was yeah. so wonderful for that Spanish family to stop and surround us and pray for us. Yeah. She speaks fluent French also. So um right. she does she doesn't she just communicate very, um, in English. She would be very comfortable around uh Spanish speaking people. She's yeah. been in Guatemala and goes very good. And she's, she's comfortable around homeless people. There's places where she would be, you know, at feel right at home and be uh, comfortable and not scared at all in some of those settings. So right. yeah, right. that's a possibility. She loves people, you know, and we want that. We want people to understand that. So if, if, if the homeless people were to surround her, she would she would not feel uncomfortable with that because she's always she lives right there around a whole bunch of homeless people and okay. she's used to helping with that so she wouldn't be scared yeah well you guys raised a very very special woman here and uh, i just want to thank you so much for this time that you shared with us and all of this information i do have uh the the tip line on the screen that is for Harris County. I mean, is that where the, that information should go? I just want to make sure we're, we're giving out the best contact info. Right. Um, we're, we're kind of asking people also to call Texas EquiSearch okay. and, um, we have flyers with their number on it. I'll include their number uh, in the, yes, uh, Texas EquiSearch, uh, okay. any, any sightings like that, they have been running down sightings that they're, they're trying, they're trying their hardest. We're trying our hardest. We are not letting anything fall through the cracks. And you two be sure to take care of each other through all this too. I know marriages can sometimes be tested when facing a situation like this, but it sounds like with that great foundation of faith that you guys have, I think you're in pretty good shape. So 36 years. Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> 36 years. Yeah. All right. Thank you both so much for joining us here today. It's a case that has a lot of conditions that we hear about in missing persons cases, but some very unique challenges that quite honestly, I have never come across before. So I just want to give another thank you to both Robbie and Rosa for spending this time with us. And 
coming here to share the information that they have and hopefully we can get that better version of the details out there and help the world come to a better understanding and maybe help bring Kealana home. That's ultimately what we're here trying to do. So thank you so much again to you, wonderful brain scratchers, for being this amazing audience out here. Of course, we can't do this without your support. If you watch this video, you're only going to see at the most two commercials, one at the beginning, one at the end. That's because I want to keep you focused on the case and we don't need to interject commercials every 10 minutes. Of course, we can't do that without support. So a big thank you to new patron Karen H and everyone else that has joined on Patreon previously. If you want to help support the channel, please visit lordandarts.com. There you can sign up for Patreon. You can sign up for PayPal. You can buy merchandise, or you can even just buy us a coffee like Badger, Badger, Badger Poppy recently did. We really appreciate all of your help as we continue trying to help as many of these cases we, as we can and spending time with families like we're doing here today. So thank you guys so much. Have a great day, and I'll see you back here on Friday for a brand new episode on the Lord and Arts channel.